Okay, so this video is basically, the whole moral of the story here is how not to blow up your radio. <laughs> um, some basic diagnostics that anybody can do with bare minimum of equipment. Um, and properly setting up your radio system, uh, which is the most important thing. These radios would not be here if the antenna system was properly set up. Um, don't pay attention to that one over there. That's, uh, it's also a president, but that's a different customer. I'm, that one's just sitting there warming up. Uh, I got the covers on it. Got to let it sit for about a half hour, 45 minutes to warm up so I can do the uh, <clears throat> alignment on it. But uh, this customer sent both of these radios in. Um, they were, and by the way, pardon the yellow fingernails. Yeah, I've been out. It's, it's harvest season for uh, black walnuts and hickory nuts. <laughs> and uh, yeah, occasionally I'll... I'll shell out the nuts, the outer husk off of them, and forget to put gloves on. And yeah, trust me, you get that stuff on your hands, you don't wash it off. You rub it off because it dyes your fingers yellow. So no, I'm not dying of some weird flesh-eating bacteria or something. It's called picking up black walnuts and hickory nuts with without gloves on. <laughs> That's all that is. I even bleached, literally bleached my hands. Put them in, in bleach. And yeah, that's all the better it gets. <laughs> um, but anyhow, this customer... Um, put up a new antenna on a boat. He's a fisherman. Uh, I think he said one of these radios belongs to him, the other one belongs to another guy that has a you know fisherman boat. Um, and apparently there's a third. I, I guess that one might be coming in <laughs> eventually. It belongs to his father. But he specifically bought a new antenna. He wanted a little bit better performance, so he wanted to put, a, put up a new antenna. The radio was apparently working fine before. So here's the, the first key. If you have a, a radio, it's receiving and transmitting okay, but you'd like to have a little bit better you know, receive performance and transmit performance, and you can get that with a better antenna. And you install that new antenna, and then all of a sudden the radio doesn't seem to be doing as good. Stop. Don't sit there with the radio keyed trying to talk to people. If all, if it's literally, if it's obvious that it's, it just doesn't seem right, there it isn't. So, trust me, something is wrong. <laughs> so... These radios have an, a built-in internal SWR meter. They work fine. Um, if you have a radio, so you don't need specifically to be these radios. Don't need to be CB radios. They can be amateur radios. Any radio. Anytime you do antenna work, you put a coax cable on. You change your antenna. Change the grounding system or something. You should check your antenna SWR, your standing wave ratio. In a nutshell, speaking of nuts, what SWR is... Standing wave ratio, basically, when you key the mic, the radio creates RF energy. It leaves the antenna jack through your coax cable, goes out to your antenna. What it expects to see on a radio like this, pretty much any CB radio, or most amateur radios, what they're expecting to see is a 50 ohm impedance. Not a resistance, but a 50 ohm impedance. Okay, that's what they're expecting to see. If they don't see that 50 ohm impedance, some of the RF power gets reflected back. It basically bounces back to the radio. The higher the SWR is, in other words, the worse the mismatch is, because this radio is operating at, 50, at a 50 ohm impedance at the coax jack. If the antenna, and you're using a 50 ohm coax cable, and a 50 ohm, ideally, it should be a 50 ohm antenna, you know, when it's tuned properly for the center of your operating frequency range. If it doesn't see that 50 ohms, and the worse it gets, the more and more power gets reflected back to your radio. Eventually, if enough power gets reflected back to the radio, it blows up. <laughs> magic smoke comes out. So one of these has had magic smoke come out. The other one, no magic smoke came out, but neither of them transmit anymore. Uh, so, big key here is... If you're just starting out with radio, biggest thing, the two things to make sure. You, you're not overvolting your radio. That's an easy way to kill a radio, and especially in mobile applications like cars or even boats, trucks and whatnot. If the regulator goes out, let's say, on your alternator, it could be shooting 18, 20 volts to the battery and your radio and also the ECM in your car, and it's going to fry stuff eventually. Um, What's probably the most common problem you have, though, is is the antennas. They're not properly tuned. People go out, they buy an antenna, they slap it on their roof, stick it on a pole, whatever, it depends what type it is. They just run a piece of coax cable out to it, hook it up to the radio, grab their mic, and start talking. Big mistake. 
you're asking for trouble. There are very few antennas that are perfect, a perfect match out of the box. Could you get lucky and get one? Yes. Are the odds good? No, they're not. <laughs> the odds are actually good. This is going to happen to them. You're going to damage your radio. May not be immediate, but eventually it's going to shorten the life of your radio. So check your SWRs. If you have a radio that doesn't have a built-in internal SWR meter, buy one. It doesn't need to be a, a expensive digital analyzer. I've got big antenna analyzers that I paid, God, that one I paid over two grand for. You don't need fancy stuff like that. You can go buy one of those cheap, I have no idea what they cost, probably, what, 10 to $15, probably one of those cheap little, like, workman uh, SWR meters. It just has a little analog meter, a knob, and a slide switch. The knob is for setting the set point, for calibrating it. The slide switch has a forward and, and re reflected or reverse position. That's it. That's all you need. It goes in line between the radio and the antenna. And that's what it's measuring. It's measuring the power that comes back to the radio. Ideally, you want it to be zero. Big goose egg. There shouldn't be any power coming back to the radio. You, granted, there is no such thing as the perfect antenna. But, um... Like I say, you want to get that ideally as close to a one-to-one -one match as you can. The higher you get up in SWRs, that's more power coming back to your radio. So, what does it do to the radio? Well, in the case of both of these, it nuked the finals. So, um, you can do some basic diagnostics yourself on something like this with nothing more than an ohm meter. Doesn't need to be a fancy bench multimeter. Doesn't even need to be a fancy handheld multimeter. Just a simple volt ohm meter. That's it. As long as it has an ohm meter function. It can be a, another, just like your SWR meter. It can be a little cheap $10 Chinese knockoff thing. As long as it can measure resistance, and it doesn't even really need to be that accurate. You're just looking to see if there's a short. So, what we want to check, we have two finals in these radios, okay? There's one there, one there. We have driver, transistor, and two finals. So what we want to do is, is just check to see, is there a short in that circuit? So, doesn't matter if you have, in the case of this radio, it uses FETs, or field effect transistors, metal oxide, or MOSFET, okay? It could be an older radio that has bipolar transistors, so you, know, you could have NPN, PNP transistors. We're not going to get into actually doing proper measurement to see on how it does. We just want to see if it's shorted out because honestly, especially in the case of radios that use a chassis like this, similar to this, they usually just short out. These MOSFETs just poof, they go, they, but they'll either blow up physically, parts all over the inside of the radio, or they'll just be a dead short. So, just take your own meter. Now remember, semiconductors, Basically, you can think of MOSFETs or even bipolar transistors like a diode. You'll usually see in between different leads of that component, high resistance in one direction, flip your leads around, and you'll see a lower resistance. So we just want to see, do we have something like that? So in this radio, the way these are configured, the left terminal on each of those MOSFETs is attached to the ground plane, all of this ground plane that runs throughout the, the entire radio. The center terminals, through this trace right here, are connected together. So we can test both of them together. And then the right-hand leads are separate. So if we just put one probe there, basically on the ground plane, we'll check to this center trace that goes to the center of both of those transistors, and we have 0.3 ohms. Yeah, that's a dead short. If we check to the right-hand lead of the left transistor, eh, about 6 ohms. Check to the right-hand lead of the right transistor. Yep, about 6 ohms. Now, if we flip our leads around in the opposite polarity, now put the positive lead to the ground plane. Check at that center trace. Yeah, 0.3 ohms again. Yeah, exactly the same as it was before. You know, we now have like 5, 6 ohms. And yeah, like 6 ohms again. So it's shorted out. They're dead shorted come over to this other radio, do the same thing. We've got, imagine that, 0.3 ohms again. Go to the right hand, get, get it on there, the right hand lead. Yeah, 2 ohms. <laughs> 0.6 ohms. Flip the polarity around here. Yeah, 
0.3 ohms, the right hand lead about 0.5 and about 0.5. So yes, the finals are just fried. <laughs> fried into a short on both of these radios. Now, this one doesn't have any obvious, or no, actually this is the one that does have obvious physical damage. This one had the smoke come out. This one did not. Um, so, if you own a radio that looks, it doesn't need to be a Lincoln. It can be one of any, a lot of different radios. But there's a lot of radios out there that use a very similar looking radio or similar chassis. If you open up your radio and it looks anything like this, these shielded cans like this, just the layout, they're pretty much using the same chassis. They probably all came out of the same plant. <laughs> you know, just different names on the front of the radio. Um, but what you want to do is don't just replace those there's a really good chance in my experience especially with with these radios it's a probably a 40 to 50 percent chance this am regulator transistor is probably shorted out the other 60 percent you know somewhere around there i'm going to say half or less you know a little bit less it's shorted but it's very common when those burn out that this could also get damaged now, even if the AM regulator transistor, which is a TIP36, even if it's still working, I always replace it. If the finals are shorted, all that power that burned them up was directed through this transistor. And in this radio, it also blew apart off of the board. So this one actually has some, the magic smoke got let out of this one. So I actually have the part <laughs> right here. It's a, what's left of a fair, yeah, God, it, yellow walnut and black or walnut and hickory nut fingernails got it's driving me nuts but yeah, it blew the wire off of the end of this so you can see it's just charcoal down there it didn't actually damage these the ceramic capacitors will still be fine it just needs to be cleaned up but like i say even if this transistor is still working replace it do yourself a favor all the power that blew that part up passed through this so even if it's still working, it has been stressed. Trust me, it's just cheap insurance. Um, and it's not like these parts are rare or hard to get. You can get the, the finals and these AM regulators from any electronic supplier like DigiKey, Mauser, Newark. You know, pick your, pick your poison for whoever you're buying your parts from. But they're easy to get and they're cheap. Just replace them. Uh, it, it'd be, especially if you're, you know, you, if you repair radios for a living, uh, do your customer a favor so they don't have to send the radio back to you again, you know, a couple months down the road when the AM regulator transistor goes up. Um, another interesting thing, speaking of regulator transistors, don't waste your money on a max mod. Um, I've been having people asking me recently, hey Mike, can you put a max mod in my President Lincoln or in my, you know, name a radio, you know, but can you put a max mod in? And my answer is no. You're wasting your money. It's all smoke and mirrors. You're being, but in most cases, you're just being ripped off. If you stick a max mod on a curve tracer, and then stick a, stick that transistor right there, a tip 36 transistor on a curve tracer, and you overlay the traces, guess what? They look exactly the same. Exactly the same. Yes, I suspect, along with some other people, <laughs> that the max mod transistor is nothing more than a tip 36 in a slightly larger package that's all it is and it costs a lot of money several times more than what that transistor cost and it's the same thing it has the exact exact electrical electronic or electrical characteristics there is no difference it's just a physically a little bit bigger that's it and even then, now I know what some people will say, okay, but it's physically bigger, it can trans, because that was kind of my fault initially was, well, it is in the slightly larger package size, so yeah, it might be able to transmit heat a little bit more efficiently to the heat sink. Well, that's kind of the problem, though. This isn't mounted to what I would consider a real heat sink. This is a real heat sink. Yes, this is a piece of aluminum that acts as a heat sink, but it doesn't have fins sticking out the side of it. There's a steel cover that goes over this. So irrelevant of what, how big it is, this piece here can still only dissipate heat out through the side and around the back so fast. It just, 
yeah, you're wasting, and even then, so there have actually been some thermal testing done on the difference between the Max Mod and an original, and it's it's within the margin of error. The temperature difference is within what you would consider your margin of error for measurement. So, yeah, it's just, don't, don't waste your money. The, there's absolutely nothing wrong with that Tip 36. That thing can handle way more power than those two finals could ever produce. So, yeah, it's just save your money. <laughs> it's, that's all it is. It's just another way to remove money out of your pocket. It's a pocket-draining device. So, there you go. There's a few tips. Like I say, just really quick test. Like I say, just a cheap ohm meter. You can just check to see if your finals are shorted out. If they are, and they're in a chassis like this, it could be an any tone or a striker, be a president, be any of the other other brands. Um, if the finals are shorted out, do yourself a favor, replace the regulator. If it's not already bad, it took one hell of a hit. Um, and then also check for like in specifically in in these chassis radios check that ferrite bead right there to make sure that it didn't get, you know, one end get blown off. Um, and you also check that one right there because I have seen that one damaged before. Um, now, that's the one part you're probably not going to be able to just go to, like, DigiKey and Mount. Now, granted, actually, they do sell these, but if you don't know exactly which, which one to get, because that's kind of the problem, the part number for this is a president part number. It's not from you know, like Ferrite, the company that makes choke products like this, they don't give you that part number, so it's kind of hard to tell which one you need to get. Honestly, you don't need to replace it. There's nothing wrong with the active part of this l little choke. The only problem with it is the wire got blown off of the end of it. So all you need to do is take some pliers, pull out the old burned off wire, Grab your little cutoff terminal leads bin. That's why I always tell people, save all your cutoffs. Find a piece of wire that's the same diameter. Stick it in there. And look at that. There's a brand new ferrite choke to stick back in the radio. So, now, these from the factory, pretty much all of these things, will usually have a little bit of glue around one end. This one easily pulled out because the glue was on the end that blew off of it, so it charcoaled it. But it doesn't hurt the ferrite compound. It did, like I say, burn the glue. But if the glue is still in there, you can easily, just with a pair of pliers, grab, usually grab that wire and pull it out. It, it's not like it's glued through the entire little tube right there. It's only just a little bit of glue right on the end to keep the wire from bouncing around. So, yeah. Uh, you don't have to buy a new one of these. You can just stick a cutoff terminal lead in there. Just try to make sure that you use a piece of wire that's the same size that you removed out of it. So, uh, I'll probably just end the video here. So, like I say, moral of the story, if uh, you're just setting up a new radio system, or you're changing your coax cable, or doing something to your antenna, or replacing your antenna, it is so important to check your standing wave ratio. You do not want RF power leaving the radio and being a ping pong ball, ping pong ball, and bouncing back into the radio. Those things are really good at making power. They're not really good at receiving it. <laughs> when they receive too much power, they go bye-bye, just like they did in this radio. So, um, I hope that helps. Uh, like I say, simple test anyone can do with bare minimum amount of equipment.